We are so grateful that everybody is here with us tonight in our Bible study on Acts 26. This is a another interesting chapter that we read through and go, what am I supposed to take from this chapter? Well, Holy Spirit and Eugene Peterson and a few other folks have given us something to glean from this another courtroom setting. Wow. wow. So wow. thank you for your time. Thank you for your attention. Thank you for your friendship to all those that are listening, however they are listening. So, Father, we love you. Thank you, Holy Spirit. You're so good. Thank you, Holy Spirit. You're so faithful. Thank you, Holy Spirit. You're so faithful to speak to us. Thank you, Holy Spirit. You're so faithful to show us in your word what is relevant for our day, for our time, for our situation. And Father, we continue to wait on you to fulfill the promises and the purposes of our lives. We continue to wait and watch you work because we know that you're working even when we can't see you. You're working. We love you, Jesus. Come in, sit down with each one of our friends tonight. Yes, Lord. Come in. Sit in their space. Sit in their bedroom. Sit in their living room, on their deck, wherever they've gathered with the word. Sit down with them, Father, and be present. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. Last week, um, when I finished up, I said we were going to pick this up again with King Agrippa II. And that's where we are. The end of 25 says that um, Felix, I'm sorry, Festus would bring Paul, the Apostle Paul, before King Agrippa so that he might examine him to be able to write a letter of accreditation, a letter of accusation. 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 There you go. To submit to Caesar, to send with him to Caesar, because he needed to have a letter of introduction to send with the prisoner. And it seems to me, scripture says, verse 27 of Acts 25. It seems to me unreasonable to send a prisoner and not to specify the charges against him. And that's where we left off last week. <clears throat> and I would have to agree with that. You know, you got to know why you do what you do. Yeah, you got to know the charges. You got to know the charges. If, if, if there's no charges, let me go. That's right. So King Agrippa was eager Chapter 25 also says he was eager. He was waiting. He was anticipating what Paul was going to say. So let's pick up Acts 26, verse 1 and 2, Jerry. Oh, well, before you before you read that. Let's re let's be reminded of the players in our courtroom, okay? <laughs> so our players in our courtroom is Felix and Festus. Actors. Uh -huh. They were both uh, governors over Judah, and they were both Gentiles. And then we have Ananias and the other high priest and the elders. They were Jewish, um, probably of Pharisee or Sanhedrin positions. And then we have King Agrippa II, who was also a Gentile, the great grandson of Herod the Great. Why, now, Barbara, why is that so important? Well, so glad you asked, Jerry. Let's read Acts 9, verse 15. Okay. Acts 9, verse 15 will give us the answer as to why knowing who all the players are is important. Acts 9, chapter 15. Acts chapter 9, verse 15. Now the Lord said to him, Ananias, 
go, for this man is a chosen vessel of mine to bear my name before Gentiles, kings, and the children of Israel. For I will show him how many things he must suffer for my name's sake. So this was written. This is, an, is exactly what God told Ananias when Paul had had his experience on the Damascus Road. Ananias was visited by Holy Spirit to say, you've got to go and witness, lay hands on this Saul and witness to him so he may, one, receive his sight, but also because I have chosen him to be my witness to Gentiles, kings, and the children of Israel. So that is exactly where Paul is at. Wow. Paul has now positioned for the last several chapters and into 26, he is positioned exactly where God wants him to be. Before Gentiles. Before Gentiles. Kings. Kings. And children of Israel. And the leaders of children of Israel. Wow. He is exactly where God wants him to be. However, he is yet in chains. But chains or free. God didn't say, but he did say what he would suffer mm -hmm, mm -hmm. for his name. Mm -hmm. So the chains are definitely, I think, even in the 21st century, chains are a form of suffering. Probably not as Paul had envisioned this prophecy given to him by Ananias, which I believe wholeheartedly Ananias being the good, godly, righteous man that he was to go and visit this tyrant. Paul or Saul at the time, um, he would have shared this word with Saul. He mm -hmm. would have told mm -hmm. Saul, this is what God says about you. And this is what he has for your future. Oh, by the way, this is the only reason I came. <laughs> <laughs> However, Paul was happy because he was in this position again. He was going to preach the gospel again. And Paul was happy about it? Well, let's look at verse 2. So about, now, Jerry, why don't you read three? chapter 26, verse 1 and 2 of Acts. <clears throat> then Agrippa said to Paul, you are permitted to speak for yourself. <clears throat> so Paul stretched out his hand and answered for himself. I think myself happy, Keep on. King Agrippa, because today I will answer for myself before you concerning all the things which I am accused by the Jews. Guys, I love this. This just exploded in my spirit. I think myself happy. Here he is with <laughs> chains on his wrist, chains on his ankles, and he is saying to Paul or to King Agrippa, I just think I am so happy. I am so fortunate to be standing right here in front of you. This is a good day. Hallelujah. Let's just give Jesus some praise right here. I mean, he just was, I think myself happy, King Agrippa, because today I shall answer for myself. Folks, can we just take a little lesson here? I don't think I would be that way. I, I don't know. I've never been in this situation. I don't know. But Paul was settled. And he was tired. He was of settled in his spirit. And he knew who held the keys to his future. He may have had chains on his wrist, chains on his ankles. He may have been in a striped outfit. But he knew who held the keys to those chains, and he was happy. So this I get to answer against my accusers. I get to say for myself. Yes. I don't need a lawyer. I don't need a paraclete. I am answering for myself. Yes. So with that, I had to do some investigation into when the book of Philippians was written. Now, Philippians, there's some contradiction um, in my Bible. I just read it a little bit ago, but in the opening 
information of the book of Philippians in my Bible says it, there's two different schools of thought one was it was written while he was in prison in Caesarea Maritime which is exactly where he is tonight right other school of thought was it was written in prison in Rome mm -hmm. yeah. either way this passage is written in prison right okay so let's flip over to Philippians chapter 4 verse 4 So Philippians 4, verse 4 says what, Jerry? Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. Let your gentleness be known to all men. The Lord is at hand. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be known to God. And the peace of God, which passes all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Finally, brethren, whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are good report, if there's any virtue, if there's anything praiseworthy, meditate on these things. The things these things, the things which you have learned, received, and heard, and saw in me, do these, and the God of peace, the God of peace will be with you. Hallelujah. Come on and preach. That is so powerful because the God, the things that um, Paul writes here in Philippians is all about rejoicing. Right. He's writing it in prison. Come on. He's writing it in prison. Now, last week, we talked a lot about waiting and waiting on the Lord, but this just goes so hand in hand with that. Are we happy in the waiting? Are we rejoicing in the waiting? Are we thinking on good things? Are we thinking on praiseworthy things? And then in my notes, I, I bolded the last, sentence the things which you learned and received and heard and saw in me do these come on my 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 what testimony are we giving out to others we, we, we gotta... that watch us that watch our life that watch our attitude that watch the way we behave in hard situations what are they learning when they see us, when they watch us, when they hear us talk about our struggles, what will they walk away from? And what have will they learn from us? Will they learn about the God of peace being with us? Or will we they learn about our struggle mm -hmm. and about how bad the enemy is mm -hmm. and how the enemy is coming against us so hard? Paul doesn't say anything about that. Paul talks about the God of peace. He talks about rejoicing and being gentle because the Lord is what? The Lord is at hand. Hallelujah. Come He's on. close yeah, to me right you. now. I just want to right. close you look at the drawing, it's real easy. And what they did wrong. My time of struggle. We got it. I'll have them back to you before long. <laughs> I'll bring them back to you in like 30 minutes. Just, I'll get them to David you. David Seymour, your, your microphone is on. Thank you for muting it. Thank you for being with us. So this is a message to us today about what are we exhibiting to others? Come on. What are we exhibiting to others in our time of wait? Now, the beloved Apostle Paul had every right to be anxious, Jerry, and highly concerned for his life while he was standing before King Agrippa. So why was he so concerned? It sounds like he was pretty happy. He sounded like that he was finally able to yes. answer for himself against the accusers 
Why do you think Paul... But he had every right to be anxious is what I said. So why was he... Why did he have the right to be anxious? Yes. Why do you think Paul had the right to be anxious, even though he didn't say that in Scripture? Even though he doesn't... That's that's right. He does not emanate any anxiety, but he did have every right to be anxious. And that is because who he was standing in front of. King Agrippa is the great grandson of Herod the Great. So we have four generations. And you know the old saying, history repeats itself. And bad stuff runs downhill. <laughs> okay. And you know, when you have history with people and you come in contact with that person again, you think that same history is going to happen again. Well, let's look at the history that we have here about the Herodian family line. You have a little chart on page two of the Herodian family tree. I'm not even going to attempt to try and explain all that. I'm just going to pick out some highlights and you'll see those. So King Herod the Great was the great grandfather. Herod Antipas is the great uncle to the current King Agrippa II. Herod Agrippa I was the father, and now we're currently under the rule of King Agrippa II. All of these generations inherited each other's character flaws as they grew up, as the generations had children. And each one of these powerful men had a confrontation with God in their lifetime, but failed, failed to realize the importance of the moment. They all had a, con did you hear that? All four of these men in this family line. family line all had a confrontation with God and they all failed to realize who they were facing. So Herod the Great, he was the governor of Galilee and the king of the Jews when Jesus was born. To the point, remember, he was saying in scripture in Matthew, the Christmas story, a king of the Jews. Well, we can't have another king of the Jews born. So he killed all the babies two years old and younger Mass. in the attempt to kill Jesus. Mass slaughter. The wise men were the ones that confronted Herod the Great with the good news of the coming Messiah. They were the one. They presented that call. Have you not heard the stars in the sky? We and, know the story. And the scribes came and said, yeah, that's 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 true. That's true. Then Herod Antipas. He was. um he beheaded John the Baptist when John the Baptist confronted him about his um, incestuous relationship with his daughter. Right. Wife's daughter. His wife's daughter. King Agrippa I now, the father of the king that's currently ruling, had a se severely persecuted the church and imprisoned Peter, that's a typo. That's a typo. I'm sorry. He imprisoned Peter and he executed James, the son of Zebedee. So Paul now is standing in front of his son, King Agrippa II, going, Okay, I know what all of his ancestors did. What's going to be my plot, mm -hmm. my fate? King Agrippa is now hearing Paul's testimony and responds with sarcasm. You know, I, if you know me at all, in any way, I do not do well with sarcasm. Sarcasm gets under my skin. I just, I cringe when I recognize sar sarcasm because there's always a level of truth to it. Good sarcasm has a level of truth to it. So just forget the joking part of it. Just give me the truth, you know? So, but
But King Agrippa responded to Paul's testimony with sarcasm. And we'll read part of that tonight. Was this king going to follow in the footsteps of his ancestors who killed outspoken, God-fearing Christians? The enemy of Paul's soul had to have had brought these events to his mind during the night hours of waiting. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You know, Paul, too, laid his head down on the pillow and tried to sleep the night before. Could the enemy had come against him and started reminding him of these events. But Paul was steadfast in God's uh, peace as he delivered his offense, offense, as he delivered his offense to the accusations of the Jews. Offense, you said, well, I thought he was in the courtroom. He was in the courtroom. Why isn't he giving his defense? Nope. Instead he of his offense. Because... Any good LSU uh, <laughs> fan would know a offense puts scores on put brings up scores. Defense can score, but that's rare. That's right. Offense makes Is points. What wins the game? Offense. So I thoroughly enjoy a good courtroom debate, a good courtroom TV show. And I probably enjoy them because I'm not a great debater. I can say my piece and that's done, but don't keep throwing back and forth all these objections. I, I just kind of melt down and go, forget it. I'm done. But I love the pro I love to hear a good debate. And I enjoy thoroughly a good courtroom movie. But it never fails that the defendant wants a great attorney to defend them, to de demonstrate and expose their innocence. Mm -hmm. Our unregenerated, selfish human beings, our default is to stand and give a defense for our actions. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Paul is in a courtroom, right? Well, Paul did not defend himself. In peace and Holy Spirit confidence, he gave an offensive position instead. He addressed the king in personal terms and attempted to persuade him for his need for a savior. What? Here, I, I thought he was on trial and here he's preaching. That's what Paul does. That's what Paul does. So Jerry, read Acts 26, 19 through 23. Therefore, King Agrippa, I was not disobedient to the heavenly vision, but declared first to those in Damascus and then Jerusalem and throughout all the region of Judea and then to the Gentiles that they should repent, turn to God and do the works befitting repentance. For these reasons, the Jews seized me in the temple and tried to kill me. Therefore, having obtained help from God to this day, I stand witnessing both to small and great, saying no other things than those which the prophets and Moses said would come, that the Christ would suffer, that he would be the first to rise from the dead and would Proclaim light to the Jewish people and to the Gentiles. Go ahead and read on down through 27. Now, as he thus made his defense, Felix said with a loud voice, Paul, you are beside yourself. Much learning has driven you mad. mad. But he said, I'm not mad. Most noble Festus, those but speak the words of truth and reason. For the king, before whom I also speak freely, knows these things. For I am convinced that none of these things escape his attention, <clears throat> since these things were not done in a corner. King Agrippa, do you know, do you believe the prophets? I know that you believe. So Paul has just finished giving his testimony 
of what happened on the road to Damascus in the earlier verses. And then he proclaims that I have been faithful to that vision. I have done what that vision has said for me to do. I have preached. I have brought people to repentance, to turn to God and do works befitting to repent, to uh, repentance. And so he presented the gospel that even to the point that Christ suffered and died and he was the first to rise again and that he would proclaim the light to the Jewish people first and then to the Gentiles. He lays the gospel out again before Festus and King Agrippa to the point that they now are on trial. Right. They are the ones that are faced with the eternal question of what are you going to do with Jesus? He flipped the tables. He totally flipped the tables. And then in uh, verse 27, this is so oh profound. God. Oh, come on. King Agrippa, do you believe the prophets? Well, I know that you do believe. Agrippa and Agrippa one and Antipas and Herod the Great were all so closely connected to the Jewish traditions. Right, right. That they actually appointed who the high priest was going to be. Right. So they knew all about what the prophet said. They were not ignorant about the Jewish faith. To the extent that Herod the Great went and got the scribes to read the prophecies concerning the Messiah. These guys were not ignorant of the Jewish tradition or the writings. Right. Exactly. So that's why he's able to say to King Agrippa, once again, bringing him to a point of decision, do you believe the prophets? Well, I know that you believe. Well, in a good court of law, that would have been overturned because the question was asked and answered by the same person. Right. <laughs> <laughs> you know, that's not an appropriate action in a regular court of law, but yet Paul used it for his benefit. And in verse 28, what was Agrippa's response? Oh, you almost persuaded me to become a Christian. Wow. Wow. Once again, the rulers of the land, the kings and the governors of the rulers of the land have come face to face with the gospel and they have not recognized it. But out of Paul's deep concern as a missionary, right. his missionary heart is now going to be exposed. He's going to expose his heart to these guys. And in turn, he says, in verse 29, Paul says to them, I would to God that not only you, but also all who hear me today might become both almost and altogether such as I am, except these chains. Wow. He's wow. saying to them, his missionary heart, his heart of love has reached out to everyone in this courtroom. I wish all of you, not almost, but would wholeheartedly lay your life down for the sake of the gospel. Right. Just as I have, just not with these chains. Can you not just hear them all just go, oh, oh, I mean, I, I'm sure they were all just pierced by that saying because they saw Paul's heart. Right, right. So I have other life application. You might better go ahead with your life application. Okay. So out of chapter 26, what can we learn? What can we take away from this? So I've got three life applications that we can hopefully use and benefit from. The best defense is still a good offense. We don't have to defend ourselves. As believers in Christ, the world does not need more evidence of the deity of Christ 
or arguments that God exists. That's not what they ne they need. They need a confrontation with a man or a woman to whom God means everything to them. There you go. And they're not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. Amen. That's what the world needs. Another thing we can take from this is God doesn't need to be defended. He is perfectly capable of defending himself. So that takes a burden off of us, right? We just deliver the mail. What we do need to do is to live in obedience to Jesus and enter the world with a confidence and an enthusiasm that springs from having our lives centered on Jesus. Mm -hmm. That's what Paul did. He entered with peace. He entered his life circumstances with peace, confidence, and joy, knowing that God was the center. And be it in chains or be it free, be it alive or be it dead, he is in the presence of God. Amen. And that's where he that's where he lands and that's where he stays. Thank you, Barbara. That was excellent. And appreciate you just driving home the life application. And um, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Acts chapter 27. The journey. You're welcome. The journey to Rome continues. So the name of my uh, lesson tonight is wait for it. Wait for it. So as I, I read through this chapter, I kept asking myself, what is so important? What, what do I need to pull out? What is Holy Spirit highlighting? In this journey, once again, Paul is traveling by sea from point A to point B to point C, point D, E, F, G, all the way to Rome, Italy. But as I started doing some research, I found out that this one chapter is sought after and discussed and researched by ancient mariners and of ar um, archaeology and um, antiquity have studied this chapter because of the details that Dr. Luke records. Dr. Luke is so meticulous in the details. Dr. Luke records the journey, the reason for the journey, and great details of the resulting shipwreck. So, by the way, this is the last recorded journey that Paul took, but commentaries, and there's some evidence in Scripture that this was not his last journey, that he was released in Rome, and he traveled to as far east as Spain. But, so, th let's look at this chapter, and once again, put on our cruise hat, like we did before, and travel with Paul from port to port and see what happens. Through this journey, we recognize delays. Paul's life has been littered with trouble, storms, persecutions, living in the will of God. Boy, that, that's controversial. Living in the will of God. See, I've always been taught not always, but I have been taught that there, there are ways to find out the will of God. And one of these ways is called the open door. When the door is open, you walk through it, and that's clear evidence that this is the will of God. Well, Paul was in prison, and the Lord came and stood beside him. The, the, Paul And the Lord didn't open the door and said, go to Rome. No, he said, you will go to Rome. But the door was still shut. But Paul was living in the will of God. So this open door, closed door policy method of finding the will of God might not be the right thing. To understand the will of God, we have to pray through the Holy Spirit, and he will direct us. So in hard times, what are we going to do? 
hard times are coming. Hard time, trouble, tribulation, difficulty. If you haven't been through a storm, hang on. It's coming. Wait for it. It's coming. You just keep breathing. Keep breathing. So I was uh, privileged to work on a cancer patient. And uh, so she survived cancer. And she came back to receive chemotherapy the second time. And she survived cancer the second time. When I got to interview her, this was, she had come for her third series of chemotherapy. She was now diagnosed with cancer the third time. And she was happy. She was joyful. She was at peace. And I, I just pulled up a chair next to her stretcher. And I said, ma'am, can you please explain to me how in the world you have this attitude and carrying yourself with joy and confidence? She said, yes, I can. It is one little word that I got. I was in prayer and I heard one little word. Man, she had my ear at this point. She said, breathe, breathe, control yourself, control your attitude, control your fears. Think on the Lord and breathe. Just breathe. I mean, that has been a, and we, we will experience trouble, but what do we do? We control our attitude and we breathe and keep breathing. I think that is so important to us today. Trouble is coming. Job chapter five, verse seven says, man is born for trouble. Just as surely as the sparks go up, man is born for trouble. This is the oldest writing in the Bible. John chapter 16, Jesus says in verse 33, 33, in this world, you will have trouble, but <laughs> be encouraged. Be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. You can choose. You can choose your attitude. You can't choose if you're going to have trouble or not. Trouble's coming. Trouble is coming. But if you were to ask Paul how to discover the will of God, I would believe that he would say, wait for it, wait for it, and he will show you. Wait for it. So let's turn to Acts chapter 27, verse 1. <clears throat> okay. And when it was decided that we should sail to Italy, they delivered Paul and some other prisoners to one named Julius, a centurion of the Augustine Regiment. So Paul and some other prisoners were put on a ship to sail to Italy, Rome, Italy. Now, how big was this boat? Was it a boat? Was it a ship? Well, later on in this chapter, we discover <clears throat> that this ship had 276 passengers. This was no small boat. This it wasn't was, a rowboat. This was, was not a rowboat. This was not a P-Row shack. This, <laughs> this had... A, this was a seagoing vessel. And we will notice that there was a centurion in charge. His name was Julius. Now, I started doing research on the centurions. And all through the New Testament, we read about centurions. Centurions. Now, who were these guys? Well, we, we remember uh, most recent Claudius Lysias, who was the captain of the centurions at the fort of Antonio. When Paul was being mobbed in Jerusalem, in Jerusalem when he came back from Jerusalem to stop the, his um, Nazarite vow and assisted 
four other guys. And we saw how this man guarded, protected, and provided for Paul. The man of honor, Claudius Listus, wrote a letter and made sure that Paul made it to Caesarea Maritime. Now, what about Cornelius that Peter met? A honorable, a man that prayed daily and gave many alms, and his devotion came up before the Lord. This man was a centurion. How about this one? How about the centurion that was at the foot of the cross when Jesus was crucified? What was his confession? He said, surely this was the son. You see, these Roman Roman politics did not do well at choosing leaders. Barbara just went through that and showed how corrupt, how devious, how manipulative and self-seeking the leaders were. But these centurions, Rome knew how to pick military leaders. These leaders were unquestionable, the reason that Rome succeeded. So now we let's go back and we see that Paul was put on a ship with 276 to travel to Rome. And uh, I was just wondering, how would you sneak Paul into Rome? How would you sneak this general in God's army. Have you ever watched a uh, a spy movie and the spies go in as servants? They go in stealth. They go into waiting third staff. waiting staff. Well, this was even better. They sent him in as a prisoner. God sent Paul <laughs> in as a prisoner to travel in the best technology known to man, the Roman government had the absolute best technology at that time, and Paul's safety was ensured by the Roman government. Paul traveled with the prisoners. I think you call that a captive audience. <laughs> All right. Verse two. <laughs> okay. So verse two. So entering a ship of, and I have no idea how to say this, a dramatum, we put to sea, meaning to sail along the coast of Asia, Eratarskus, and Macedonia of... A Macedonian. And a, a Macedonian of Thessalonica was with us. And Stop. Stop. I really stumbled over all that. I'm sorry. So the captain chose to hug the coastline because we will see that they were traveling at the wrong time of the year. Uh, so he used, he, he, he skirted the coast and went from safe port to safe port and used the barrier islands to protect their trip, their boat, their ship from the treacherous and, and the uh, tumultuous storms in the Mediterranean during the winter months. So it was very strategic. This cap, the seagoing captain was, was uh, quite learned. But what I found interesting is Paul had obviously, Luke was traveling with Paul and he had, Artic Articus. Articus, a Macedonian of Thessalonica. Which, now, when did they let prisoners have uh, traveling companions? Isn't that interesting? Paul had traveling companions. Paul was a prisoner of Rome. Or was he? See, King Agrippa said that Paul was innocent and he could go free if he had not appeal to Caesar. Paul was traveling to Rome, but he had certain privileges. You know what you you know what I call that? I call it F O G, fog, favor of God. God gave Paul traveling companions to go with him. He was not going alone and he probably had 
two scribes. We know Luke was taking notes, and now this Articus. Could we, could we say, Jerry, that Paul had traveling mercies? He had traveling mercies. <laughs> Hallelujah. Have y'all ever prayed for traveling mercies? I have. Absolutely. <laughs> Verse. So, so, and we, we see that uh, verse three. And the next day we landed at Sidon and Julius treated Paul kindly. Come on. And gave him liberty to go to his friends and receive care. Now, how in the world did this, centur special. this centurion allow Paul freedom to go see his friends, friends in Sidon? Now, which means he probably went to the synagogue. Yeah, he went to he went to see his <laughs> his the converts, people who had heard about Paul's preaching. But what would have happened to the centurion if Paul didn't return to the boat? Uh oh. Paul, if Paul had not returned, the centurion would have suffered the penalty of any prisoner that escaped. That was there. That was the sentence on them. But guess what? Julius centurion said, take your liberty. Come back. Well, Bo will be sailing tomorrow. Go see your buddies. Y'all eat, drink, and be merry. I uh, we'll have the boat worship, ready. Praise, worship, and pray. <laughs> yeah. So do you see the favor that is on Paul's life right here? I didn't see this before, y'all. So <clears throat> verse 6. Let's jump down to verse 6. They sail from here. They sail to there. Then the centurion found a Alexandrian, Alexandrian ship sailing to Italy. And he put us on board. He hired a boat going to Rome. Yeah. Italy. From Lycia, L Y C I, Lycia to Rome. Really? Italy. What's interesting about this boat, this vessel, it was from Alexandria, Egypt, and what was it carrying? Why was this ship destined for Rome? It's because the Romans contracted with the Egyptians for grain. The Egyptians were ph phenomenal at raising rice, wheat, corn, and barley, and they exported it all over the Mediterranean Sea, and this was a grain cargo ship. Now, in the notes that you will get next week, you will see a website. I'm sorry that y'all don't have these notes. You will see a website showing exactly what these Egyptian cargo vessels look like. So, since you don't have a picture, I'll just describe to you. They didn't have a rudder. They had two oar extending out the back, and that's what they used for steering. And uh, they had a central mass. They didn't have a mass. There was a single mass vessel. Wow. Why is that important? It's important because they could not tack. They could not sail into the wind. They had to sail 15 degrees parallel with the wind, but they could not sail into the wind at all. And this, we'll see this played out in this chapter, and we'll see why this is important. So, um, verse 9. Read verse 8 and 9 for me, please. Verse 8. Passing it with difficulty, we came to a place called Fair Havens near the city of Lass. Now, when much time had been spent and sailing was now dangerous because the fast was already over, Paul advised them, saying, Men, I perceive that this voyage will end with disaster and much loss, not only of the cargo and the ship, 
but also our lives. What fast is he talking about? What is the the only required fast of the Jewish people? It was on the Day of Atonement. So Luke is giving us accurate description of when this narrative is occurring. He said, right after the fast. So we know that that is in the fall of the year. We talked about that. And during the fall of the year, it was virtually impossible and extremely dangerous to travel on the Mediterranean Sea. And because, okay, uh, let's go on just a, a little bit further. Verse 11. Wait, 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 wait. So Paul says, uh, guys, this might not be good. Well, who are you to say what we should do? Well, I just so happen to know a few things about traveling on the ocean, traveling on the sea, because I, I have been here, there, and yonder several times, and I have been on the open seas. And oh, by the way, I have a few credentials about knowing what happens on the sea. Flip over to 2 Corinthians chapter 11 for me, please. 2 Corinthians chapter 11. See, Paul always validates and always gives evidence of what he's talking about. 2 Corinthians 11, verse 25, please. Verse 25. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. A night and a day I have been in the deep. In journeys often, in perils of water, in perils of robbers, in perils of my own countrymen. Okay. So, you see, <laughs> Brother Paul knew some things about being on the water. And he's telling these guys, <clears throat> this, might not, this might not turn out good, guys. We just need to hang out here and every, everybody's safe. But so what did they do? Verse 11 and 12. Of Acts 27, never. So mm -hmm. verse, verse 10, he says, if we continue, it will be dangerous and there will, this will end in disaster, much loss, not only in cargo mm -hmm. and ship, but also our life. Now, what kind of vessel did we remember? They were on a cargo vessel and they were carrying a payload a payload they only got paid if the load got there that's extremely important they didn't weren't they weren't out for a sunday afternoon sale they were carrying cargo for pay keep reading verse 11 Nevertheless, the centurion was more persuaded by the helmsman oh, shoot. and the owner of the ship than by the things spoken by Paul. And, and because the harbor, okay, watch it. We talked about the fall of the year. And because the harbor was not suitable to winter in. So it could have been as far into the year as December or January. And the majority advised to set sail from there also, if by any means they could reach Phoenix, a harbor of Crete, opening towards the southwest and northwest, and winter there. So when the soft wind south. south wind blew softly, supposing they had obtained their desire, they put out to sea and sail close by Crete. If you want to know the will of God for your life, do you choose open door, closed door policy? No, that's not the way we find out God's will. Okay, <laughs> what, about, what about taking a vote? Surely there is wisdom in the counsel of many. No, majority rule does not work in the kingdom of God. You see, the reason these guys didn't want to stay in this port is was because it was too small. They didn't have enough entertainment for the winter. It was a safe port, but it was too small for the sailors. So they decided to go on. And Paul said, 
if we proceed from here in a rash, hushed, uh, 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 hurried way, it's going to turn out in disaster. When do we start listening to the Holy Spirit? Do we want disaster to start listening? Or can we learn from the disasters that we make? I really want to live in the will of God. And what does Paul say? Wait for it. Wait for it. Wait for it. So I think that's where we're going to stop tonight because we all desire to live in the will of God. And Paul was doing his best to live out the will of God and make it to Rome and make sure that his traveling buddies made it there alive also. Before you close, Jerry, I just want to share, not that we always have all these teachings down, down path. Trust me, God's working on us as well. But I would just, I want to share something with you out of our own personal lives that has just happened relatively recent. I don't think I've shared it with everybody here. But back in January, after going to Israel last December, we had planned to do another trip and host a trip. We were going to be the host. The, people, the ones responsible for everybody going and coming home. And we had put out flyers. We had put notifications. We were telling all of our friends, come go to Israel with us in November. We're leaving the Monday after Thanksgiving for 10 days. Let's go. Well, we didn't know why, but in July of this year, when the registrations had to start paying their money by August the 15th and be paid by September the 15th, come July, we said, nobody has registered. We Not cannot convince one. anybody to go to Israel with us this year. Let's cancel the trip. Hallelujah. Now, I can say truly, I was disappointed. I was disappointed when we had to cancel the trip because we really saw this opportunity as not only sharing Israel with others, but also as a form of income for us. Right. Well, can I tell you that come October the 5th, we go, thank you, Jesus, that we did not keep our plans to go to Israel because one, it would have totally been canceled. Nobody would have gotten their money back. I would have had 50 people breathing down my neck. Barbara, what are we doing? What are we doing? What are we doing? I but mean, God foresaw all of that. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And he allowed it to be canceled. Ahead of time. Well ahead of time. And there's peace. We're walking in peace today in light of that. Um, experience knowing that all things do turn out for our good. We don't understand when they take the turn to the right or two. We don't understand the 90 degree turns plans take at the time that they take them. But over time, the light becomes clear and we are grateful that we are not packing our bags to go to <laughs> Israel <laughs> in a week or taking care of 50 people. Past Brother Rex, you remember sitting in the corner, I told you there's another corner coming. There was another turn coming. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise God. God will direct you. God will give you. The God of peace will yes. come and direct you. Will we be still? Will we wait? Will we patiently acknowledge him in all of our ways? And so then he will direct our paths. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Father. Lord, we give you praise. We thank you, Lord, that you, the creator of all, the creator of all, the only one 
who resides outside of eternity. You love us. You desire our fellowship. You desire that all things work together. Father, and I just thank you. I thank you. I thank you. I thank you for the opportunity that you might call me friend. And I just am so at awe of you. I give you praise. And I thank you. I thank you. Yes. That you share your goodwill with us. Your goodwill. Your perfect will. You're clear, Father, that I might learn to wait. Thank you. Jesus', Jesus name. Amen. Thank you, guys. Right.